Thank you, Dr. Abrams. Um, you can see where all this evolution in the technology is really um, um, expanding the, the interventions that we can do. Um, this next presentation is a little bit out of order. I had to accommodate uh, uh, Dr. Sheeman because he had to leave uh, uh, in the afternoon. So we're going to go back to the uh, um, to the uh, uh, treatment of uh, endoleaks, uh, either in the uh, thoracic or uh, uh, infrarenal uh, uh, endovascular repair. So basically, what we like to see when we do uh, an endovascular uh, intervention is to see thrombosis of the aneurysm around the endograft and hopefully shrinkage uh, of the aorta uh, around the, uh, the repair. Now, this occurs in about 60% of the, of the cases. In about 30, 35% of cases, the aneurysm stays the same. But in about 5% of cases, the aneurysm is going gonna, is gonna to enlarge. And basically, uh, the most common cause of aneurysm enlargement uh, is to have an endoleak. And the endoleaks have been classified as type 1 when it's either proximal, type 1A, or distal, type 1B. Uh, type 2 is usually a branch flow, where you have uh, flow between two branches of the aorta, most often a lumbar and the inferior mesenteric. And then type 3 is usually uh, leakage around the junction or through the, uh, uh, through the graft. Uh, type 4 is usually a graft defect uh, uh, that is allowing extravasation of uh, uh, either serum or uh, uh, blood and then type five is the endotension that uh, Dr. Schutter mentioned that we uh, really don't understand. In some cases, we do know what has caused it, but in other cases, we haven't. Um, usually, uh, uh, what we do to follow up these patients is to get a CT scan. In our in our institution, we once we get a patient without an endoleak and an aneurysm that's stable, uh, we tend to follow them with ultrasound with duplex scan. Uh, and you can actually see the endolic uh, with a duplex scan, and uh, the advantage is that it's easily repeated and that it's uh, uh, non-invasive. So here's a patient that on completion, uh, you can see a type 1 endolic. Uh, uh, you can see the endolic right here. Uh, basically, this is a situation where immediately after deployment of the endograft, uh, you see an, a type 1 endolic, and this uh, needs to be treated. So I like to do what I call the balloon test. Basically, you inflate the balloon and you see if you were to able to oppose the, the graft better to the aorta, uh, if you el eliminate the, uh, the type 1 endoleak. Uh, in this case, we didn't have any room to put a, an extension cuff. So what we do in these instances is we deploy a Palma stent. Uh, we use a 10 by 29. Uh, we put it on a ZMED balloon. These balloons have very broad shoulders. But that actually works to you in your favor because it locks the, uh, uh, the, the uh, palma stent in the middle so it doesn't jump forward or backwards. You can see that the, the way we mount this palma stent is we open it up a little bit on each uh, of its ends and that allows it to dumbbell uh, when it's opening so it's not going to move. Very similar to the way a balloon expandable stent uh, uh, gets deployed. These need to be inserted through a sheath. You don't want to, you don't want to bear back uh, uh, a palma stent mounted in a balloon because you're going to end up leaving the palma stent in the wrong place. And uh, very often, uh, if it comes off of the balloon, then you can't even deploy it. So now you have two problems. It's in the wrong place and it's not deployed. <clears throat> so here's the, 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 the palma stent being advanced through the sheath. I usually ask the fellow to remind me to pull the, the pigtail catheter so I don't pinch it. That way, if I do pinch it, it's his fault, not mine. Uh, and basically, here's the deployment. You want to make sure that you have enough volume uh, in the syringe to fill the balloon because you don't want to stop in the process uh, of deploying the, uh, the palma stent. <clears throat> and basically, this is a deployed palma stent. One of the things that I make sure 
and this is other other uh, people do it differently, but I I do not like the palmas tend to protrude beyond the the uh, the cloth or the graft. I think that's a uh, um, a it, you run the risk of rupturing um, uh, the aorta. So therefore, I keep the palmas tent within the uh, covered uh, portion of the graft. You can see here that the endoleak has, uh, has been resolved. And uh, you can see here the follow-up on, uh, on this particular patient where the, uh, um, there's complete thrombosis of, uh, of the aneurysm. So here's what happens when you put the palmas stent outside of the um, outside of the cloth. If you uh, if you see this, you leave the balloon up, and now you got to convert. So it is not risk free to uh, put a palmas stent. This is not my case, by the way, uh, but uh, but it's something that can happen, and and that you need to avoid overinflation. And if it happens, you want to inflate the balloon and then decide what to do. So here's a case where we do a completion angiogram. This is a patient that has both a suprarenal aneurysm and an infrarenal aneurysm, old patient, 90 years old. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, type 1 endoleak here, and you can see that the uh, device is a little bit away from the, uh, from the renal artery. So we do have room here to place a cuff, but we only have room on one side uh, of the cuff. The other renal artery is relatively close. So what we uh, did in this particular case is use what we call the bent wire technique, where we put a bend in the wire and then you rotate the wire and you can see how the cuff is now oriented to purchase more aorta on this side than on this side. Uh, so it's kind of a nice uh, little technique to, uh, uh, to place a cuff uh, when you have <clears throat> sort of this particular situation where one renal is close to the top of your graph, but the other one isn't. Um, now, having said that, this cuff did not resolve the problem. Uh, it's going to be hard for you to see it, but there's still a type 1B and type 1A endo leak on this side. Um, so, what we did in this particular case is we actually accessed the uh, the sac uh, outside of the uh, of the device uh, between the iliac and the artery, and then we injected a slurry of thrombin. Um, thrombin and gel foam, and basically induce thrombosis of the graft. You can see now that on the repeat uh, art, uh, angiogram, the, uh, the injected thrombin and, and gel foam is staying, this is staying in the sac. Uh, we do add some contrast to the slurry, and uh, what that allows us to do is to see it as, uh, as we inject it. This is a follow-up, suprarenal aneurysm, and then the infrarenal component is now uh, uh, is now thrombosed uh, after the cuff and inducing uh, the uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm thrombosis. So uh, this is uh, uh, could you uh, play that video, please? All right. Could you uh, play that video for me, please? I guess not. Anyway, all right, so we'll move on. This is how we prepare the slurry. Uh, it's basically, uh, uh, we cut the gel foam in small little pieces. Uh, we uh, put in uh, uh, 1,000 units of uh, thrombin in 20 cc of saline, then we create the slurry and we put some contrast in it. Uh, and basically, uh, some people say, well, why, why not use Flosil? Well, Flosil is a lot more liquid, and I'm concerned that it may actually go into the, uh, some of the lumbar arteries and maybe uh, cause a, um, a spinal uh, problem. So I think this slurry is a little less uh, uh, likely to do that. So this is uh, one case where we used this uh, uh, technique and it didn't resolve, ended up in a conversion. You can see that basically what we were dealing with is a, is a holes in the, in the graph with a kind of a sprinkler, uh, and uh, there's, no, there's no induced thrombosis that's going to resolve that. Um, so when you get this kind of a, a sprinkler issue, uh, the management really is to line the graft with a second less porous endograft or surgical uh, convention, uh, conversion. Uh, this used to happen with the excluder, uh, before 2004. So if you see a patient that had an excluder endograft placed be before 2004 and has a, an enlarging aneurysm, 
but no evidence of endo leak. Uh, that is uh, seepage of serum uh, through the original uh, uh, device. This, that was corrected in 2004. So when all else fails, uh, you always have surgical convention, conversion. Um, you can do complete graft removal, partial graft removal. Uh, usually you don't, you, you don't need uh, to obtain distal iliac control because you can control the limbs uh, uh, from inside the aneurysm. And I'll just show you uh, a little trick that we have learned uh, in some of these conversions. That, that is, uh, you really don't need to expose the suprarenal aorta. You can actually puncture the, the graft uh, uh, and put in a uh, aortic occlusion balloon, so then you can remove the, the device if you have to uh, without having to clamp uh, the aorta. Uh, some, some will say, well, why not put this through the femoral? Well, be because then you would have to heparinize the patient and you still have to do the, uh, the exposure of the aneurysm. So basically, what you can see here is we're removing the device. We have a, a control of the suprarenal aorta and you can see the device here being removed. Now, one uh, word of caution, you can see the balloon here being removed, and then the aorta is cross-clamped, as you would do in a standard repair. One word of caution is with suprarenal uh, fixation, uh, removing the, 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 the entire graft can bring uh, the, uh, uh, some of the intima with the renal uh, orifice. I did not charge for the renal endarterectomy in this case, I assure you that. Uh, but it's uh, uh, pretty uh, scary to see that and not know what's happening with the renal artery. Uh, so since we had this experience, nothing happened, the patient did okay. But since that experience, what I have uh, suggested doing is actually you don't have to remove that portion of the graft. You can actually control it with a clamp, uh, cut the graft with wire cutters, and then sew the graft uh, uh, together with the piece of endograft that you're dealing with, leaving there uh, to a standard surgical graft. So it's, uh, it's a way of avoiding uh, doing this blind endarterectomy uh, of the uh, perirenal aorta. So now when we look at uh, endovascular repair in the thoracic aorta, the classification is the same. 1A is the proximal seal zone, 1B the distal seal zone, intercostal flow, endograft junction, and endograft leak. Uh, you treat one, three, and four. The, the tools usually you can follow, and in the, uh, in the thoracic aorta, for some reason, it is very rare to see any type of uh, aneurysm enlargement from a type 2 endoleak. Um, so here's a patient uh, uh, with a type 1A uh, endoleak. Uh, you can see the endoleak right here. The options here are either to uh, place coils or what I prefer to do is put a palma stent. And the key here in putting a palma stent is you, you have to either do adenosine or rapid ventricular pacing. So uh, one of the problems with doing adenosine is that uh, anesthesiologists never give enough. So you have about three seconds to blow up a palma stent up there and I guarantee you it's not gonna happen. So <clears throat> if you're not uh, ready to do rapid pacing, what I would suggest doing in this particular case is you can stop there. There's nothing wrong with, uh, with a type 1 uh, endo leak for 24 hours. You can come back the next day and do rapid pacing and then place the, uh, um, the palma stent. So here's basically a case uh, of a uh, uh, aortic coarctation that we were uh, dealing with. So we did rapid pacing, and you can see the uh, deployment of the palma stent to open up the, uh, the area of the uh, uh, aortic uh, coarctation. So here's a type two endoleak. Uh, you only treat these if the aneurysm is enlarging. Um, in the, it's, it, it can happen uh, if, you, if you get retrograde flow from the left subclavian. That's the easiest one to treat. You just go through up the brachial and uh, put an m uh, uh, plug or, or uh, coil it. If it's due to intercostal flow, it rarely leads to aneurysm growth. Uh, but if it has to be treated, uh, what we have uh, done in our, in our place is to have our interventional radiologist do a CD-guided uh, uh, induced sac thrombosis, uh, uh, which is probably the safest way to treat these. I have tried to get between the graft and the, and the uh, native aorta to do pretty much what we were doing uh, with the infrarenal aorta 
and uh, I have not been able to, to negotiate a catheter between the graft and the, uh, into, the, into the sac between the graft and the native artery. But most of these type 2 endo leaks are inconsequential. Here's a patient in 2008 with a type 2 endo leak. Uh, uh, three years later, the aneurysm is actually smaller. So here's a type 3 endo leak. Uh, this is an endo leak between um, um, uh, junctions of the, of the graft uh, with the aneurysm increasing to about a little over 6 centimeters uh, in size. You can, um, can you play that video? It, all right, uh, I guess not. So anyway, you, um, you reline it uh, with an additional device uh, um, and basically get rid of the type 3 endoleak uh, in that fashion. So here's uh, the pre and post treatment. The pre and post treatment, uh, here's before treatment, it was uh, 6.4 and you can see the aneurysm uh, after treatment doesn't have a type, uh, 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 does not have an endoleak. Here's an endoleak that is difficult to tell exactly uh, what's, uh, what's going on. This is a patient of mine, and it, it, uh, you learn lessons from when, when things don't go uh, exactly as you intend. Uh, this is a, this is a uh, device that was placed. If you look here, this device should have, this particular device should have been either below that curve or committed to the curve. But the, the distal device is actually pushing the more proximal device up, and that's what's causing the endoleak. Uh, so we, we were able to extend this device, but I could not get it to, um, to flare down. So this is, a, this is a, a missed deployment, and it's something to be avoided. You either commit around the, the curve, or you deploy it distal uh, uh, to, the, to the inner curve of the, uh, of the aorta. So in summary, management of endoleaks after endovascular uh, aortic repair, types 1, 3, and 4 at implantation or follow-up should be treated. Type 2 endoleaks can be observed as long as the aneurysm does not show growth. If it shows growth, the conventional uh, uh, wisdom is to go ahead and treat them. Uh, I think uh, being familiar with the alternatives to manage these endoleaks is essential, uh, not only during follow-up, but also during the implantation uh, in this particular patient. Uh, and uh, follow-up after TVAR and EVAR is absolutely mandatory. If you look at the patients that develop rupture during follow-up, uh, probably about 80% of those cases are patients that are lost to follow-up. They don't follow up after the, uh, the repair, and then they show up in the emergency room um, uh, with a rupture. So I think uh, this concludes this portion of the program. I really thank you for, uh, for your attention. I uh, don't think we're going to have time for the, uh, for the panel discussion. Um, I want to remind you that uh, for the physicians uh, in the group, uh, we're going to have simulation uh, in the CASIT, which is just around the corner uh, after lunch. And uh, for the uh, allied health personnel, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, we're going to have breakout sessions. Uh, and I believe they're right here in the, uh, in the auditorium. Thank you very much for your attention.